And here we are together again. And I, I always remind people um, why we have these observances. And part of it is not because I don't think that you remember, but I always like our guests to understand uh, that here at the National Education Association, our board members represent educators across the country and of every constituency you could imagine. Our students and our members uh, are depending on us to make uh, decisions in their best interest. And one of the things that is the beating heart of the NEA is our social justice mission. We look at these observances and we want to learn more about communities who have suffered institutional discrimination, women, racial and ethnic communities, and our LGBTQ community. And so we know the history of Seneca Falls and Selma and Stonewall, but we don't study it as history. Unfortunately, this is still current events. And think about the difference one election can make. At President Obama's inauguration, he said these words, our journey is not complete until our gay brothers and sisters are treated like anyone else under the law. For if we truly created, if we're truly created equal, then surely the love we commit to one each, to one another must be equal as well. And under his watch, he ended, don't ask, don't tell. He had policies protecting transgender soldiers from being uh, dismissed dishonorably. Under his watch, the Department of Education sent clear guidance to every superintendent in this country that they had a legal responsibility to make sure that students, transgender students, would not be discriminated against and humiliated every time they just had to go to the bathroom. And one administration later, the Trump administration has tried to reverse every single one of those humane policies, including taking away that guidance that protected our transgender students, and now uh, dismissing transgender soldiers. So we are nowhere near what President Obama said in treating our LGBTQ brothers and sisters equal under the law. And we are still studying the current effects, the current events that affect our own colleagues, our own members, and their rights to simply keep their jobs, let alone our students and their safety. And so it's very, very important that we have this observance so that we, can learn more about our responsibility in the LGBTQ uh, agenda for justice. And to help introduce our amazing speaker today, let me introduce to you the chairs of uh, the uh, GLBT caucus and our SOGI chair, Emily Osterling and Frank Berger. Good morning, NEA officers and NEA board of directors. My name is Emily Osterling. Frank Berger and I co-chair the NEA GLBT caucus, and it is my privilege to also serve as the chair of NEA's Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Committee. Frank is joining me today to introduce the LGBTQ observant speaker. As we all know, public education is under attack. When we thought it could not get any worse, we were wrong. The civil rights of our students are under persistent and strategic attack. President Trump, Vice President Pence, and Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos are not educators or education leaders. Although they have no expertise in pedagogy, curriculum development, or school governance, they have made it clear that their top priority when it comes to education is to expand alternatives to traditional public schools. What does that mean exactly? A decrease in funding to public education and the expansion of charter schools, which are publicly funded but privately operated. They want to create an industry where they can profit at the expense of our children. 
In order to achieve this, the Education Department has stripped away civil rights protections for some of the most vulnerable students, including our LGBTQ students. Here are a few examples of their anti-LGBTQ policies and practices. A month after her confirmation, DeVos and the Trump administration rescinded protections that allowed transgender students to use whichever bathroom they felt most comfortable in. By June of 2017, the Education Department announced that they would be scaling back on civil rights investigations and proposed cutting more than 40 positions from its Office of Civil Rights. But it does not stop there. Since then, the Education Department has decided to withdraw Obama-era protections for survivors of campus assault, many of whom are LGBTQ students. When DeVos was asked by a House Appropriations Subcommittee whether she would block federal voucher funding to private schools that discriminate against LGBTQ students, she refused to say whether or not she would block such funding. DeVos has now stated that private schools that discriminate against LGBTQ students should not be eligible for federal dollars. However, a Huffington Post investigation found that many institutions that participate in school choice programs, at least 14% of religious schools, have clear policies that discriminate against LGBTQ students. It is clear that the Department of Education is disregarding and eliminating the civil rights of our students. These attacks affect all of our students, but now our LGBTQ students will continue to feel even more unsafe in school. The actions and beliefs of DeVos and the Trump administration continue to feed and elevate institutional homophobia. Studies have already proven that our LGBTQ students navigate an often hostile and violent school climate, but now with an education department and a White House against them, as well as a civil rights office that won't protect them, the fight for justice, equity, and equality demands that all of us stand for and with our LGBTQ students. In this homophobic environment, we are proud of the NEA's continued fight to protect our LGBTQ students. In the absence of guidance from the Department of Education, NEA's Center for Social Justice, in collaboration with our Office of General Counsel, has released the Schools in Transition, a guide and model policies for supporting transgender students in K-12 schools to help our educators create school environments where our transgender students will feel safe and welcomed and valued. NEA has also released guidance on students' rights that provides educators with an understanding of current laws that protect students from racial, religious, and national origin harassment, a model policy that school districts should adopt to ensure those protections are fully enforced, responses to frequently asked questions that may be useful in organizing around these issues, and a list of other resources for protecting students' rights. These are all great resources that can be found on NEA Ed Justice. Today, my brothers and sisters, we ask each one of you to not only continue to advocate, but increase awareness around you, build the capacity of others, and take action. Take action at your state, local, district, school, and community level. When you can do this, a difference is made, just like in California, with the passage of the California Fair Education Act, where educators laid the groundwork for an LGBTQ inclusive curriculum. In Frederick, Maryland, the Frederick County School Board passed a policy to protect and welcome transgender students. This is just a sampling of what is happening around us to protect our students, but it can't stop there. We must continue to form partnerships with youth groups and organizations at the national, state, and local level. We need to look to our students and support their activism. For too long, adults have not viewed young people as equal partners in decision making, but now that is changing. They are our active agents who will create change and fight back to protect their civil rights. So yes, let us partner with and follow student leaders like Emma Gonzalez, who has said that being openly bisexual powers her fight against guns. Let us partner with youth-led LGBTQ organizations in your communities. At the national level, one of our partners who is taking action in the Asian Pacific American LGBTQ movement is a friend of the NEA and a friend to our work on social justice. He has connected the intersectionality of race and LGBTQ issues. He is currently working with the Center for Social Justice to create tools and resources for educators to protect and advocate for LGBTQ students. We are proud to introduce you to Glenn D. McPantai as NEA's 2018 LGBTQ Observant Speaker. 
He is currently the Executive Director of the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance, a national federation of Asian American, South Asian, Southeast Asian, and Pacific Islander, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender organizations, where he oversees the organization's trainings, advocacy on immigrants' rights, and visibility and family acceptance campaign. His efforts were recognized by the Walter and Evelyn Haas Jr. Fund with their 2017 award for outstanding LGBTQ leadership for immigrants' rights. He brings to this work nearly a decade of working with local LGBT API groups. He is a former co-chair of the Gay, Asian, and Pacific Islander Men of New York, a political, educational, social, and peer support group. He organized the first ever testimony before the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islander in 2000. He was named as one of Instinct Magazine's 25 leading men of 2004 in the magazine's November 2004 power issue. Glenn has given commentary to numerous media outlets, including the Washington Post, MSNBC TV, NBC Asian America, and The Advocate. His comments on the intersections of gay rights and traditional civil rights law have appeared in the April 2001 issue, the NYU Review of Law, and Social Change. He has published a dozen scholarly legal articles, authored reports, and has given commentary to numerous media outlets. Glenn attended the State University of New York at Stony Brook on Long Island, and as a beneficiary of affirmative action, graduated cum laude from the New England School of Law in Boston. Ladies, Ladies and, and gentlemen, gentlemen please, please give Glenn, Glenn a warm, warm NEA, NEA welcome. welcome. Why y'all standing? Y'all didn't even hear what I'm gonna say yet. Do it at the end. My name is Glenn McPantai, thank you so much. That was too long, unnecessary. You know, y'all can read my bio. So brothers and sisters, we are in a union hall and siblings, there is so much work that we need to do. There is so much work that we need to do together. Let me break down some of the stuff that we're gonna, look, I used to be a union organizer, I get it. Uh, so let me tell y'all, I'm gonna do three things for y'all. Number one, what is it that we do in Encapi at the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance? Number two, what are we doing together with the NEA? And I'm so incredibly proud and thankful for your leadership and the work that y'all are doing for our community, for our students, and for America today. And then third, let me tell you a little bit about where I've been and my personal relationship with the NEA and their members. So, you know, this organization, I love this organization. This, has done, this organization has done so much work for us all, not just for the LGBT community, not just for racial and, economic, racial and ethnic minorities, not just for women, but for America, for students, and for young people. I have done this work at the NEA for over 30 years. I remember when this building was built, and they were gonna open up some sort of education group in this building. We said, what is it, what is that? This is the mid 80s or early 90s. It was a long time ago. People don't remember that time. I'm a little older than some of y'all. Um, I know I look a little young, but you know, it's an Asian skin. Uh, so that's fine. And I used to do higher education advocacy on the Hill. I used to work with the United States Student Association. Uh, used to do advocacy on post-secondary education. And from that, I became a lawyer. And I became a civil rights attorney working at the Asian American Legal Defense Fund doing civil rights advocacy uh, for a number of times. And today I teach, I adjunct uh, at Hunter College. Uh, so I too am an educator. And I, you know, work with students. So when there was a chair here, I'm like, no, I'm gonna stand. I'm not gonna sit down. Uh, but now I'm the executive director of Incapia. And I wanna tell you a little bit about the work that we do and then talk about the program areas in which we interface with NEA and school personnel. So number one, we are a federation of LGBTQ, Asian American, South Asian, Southeast Asian Pacific Islander organizations. We do leadership development and capacity building. We have about 47 affiliates. And our job is to try to make those organizations that are in grassroots communities do their work that is stronger, more impactful, 
has greater reach and is more inclusive. To make sure that local queer Asian American organizations can find community which is culturally receptive and through social activities, education, through workshop, that is the work. And we are so happy that so many of our organizations have members of NEA and have members who are school personnel. The second area is organizing and advocacy. And you know, we started doing a organizing and advocacy with same-sex marriage and immigrants' rights. And so we told the story back then, if you all remember Prop 8 in California, that you know, we need to tell our stories as LGBT people and why we need the right to marry and to live with someone who we love and marry someone who we love, but we needed to tell that story in Vietnamese. We needed to tell that story in Lao or Ilocano. Because so often, our communities and the agenda leaves us out. Obviously, immigrants' rights, Asian Americans are the nation's fastest growing minority. In the next 25 years, one in 10 Americans will be Asian American or Pacific Islander. We are the largest segment of immigrants coming to the United States, both legal and undocumented, and more of us are coming out of the closet. So we were so proud and so thankful for working on LGBT rights and equality, but you know, the work does not stop there. It is so wonderful that we can get married, but who will come to the wedding if our parents do not accept us? Who will be there? That, lived, it's that legal equality is not the same thing as lived equality. There are so many issues that our community is facing around bullying, around violence, against employment non-discrimination and protections. That is the work that we are trying to do. And our work at Incapia is intersectional. We look at those issues at the intersections of queerness, at the intersection of sex and gender, at the intersection of racial justice, economic justice, and immigrants' rights. And one of the things that we are most proud of is our work around the Muslim ban. So Trump said that, you know, if you're from a Muslim majority country, you cannot come into the United States. And so we did it, we led the LGBT amicus brief, working with my colleagues at GLSEN and, and the HRC and a number of organizations to make the story to the United States Supreme Court and to make the story of America, to tell the story in America that, you know what, Muslims are gay too. And gays are Muslim also to tell the story of how the Muslim ban impacts our community. And you know, I teach a little bit of history, and I said, I kind of feel like we've been here before. I started this work in the 1980s, at a pro and I was at, if you all well remember the organization ACT UP, which I was in, now there's like documentary about it, it's the weirdest thing. Um, so I was in ACT UP, and we were protesting the Sixth International HIV Conference, right? Because people with AIDS could not come and attend that conference. Because what, in 1987, President Bush, the first, uh, had an anti-HIV travel ban. Wait a minute, we've been here before. In 1952, in my immigration class, uh, immigration law class, LGBT people were persons of bad moral character. They are under a travel ban. Wait a minute. In 1882, we had a Chinese travel ban. Chinese people couldn't come into the disaster. We have been here before. We should never forget. Our issues are intertwined. It affects all of us. You know, the stuff that this administration is doing is really out of bounds. And so in California and Illinois, Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General of the United States, said that he would sue those states because they were sanctuary cities. And they are sanctuary cities, so we're not going to give you any funding. And we looked at it and we said, you know, these are programs that support us. These are programs that support anti-hate crimes, which are LGBT and gender inclusive. Right, which are programs to protect our communities. We need those federal dollars, and so guess what? We're gonna sue Attorney General Jeff Sessions in California, <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll be doing something together with NEA to sue Betsy DeVos. That's another one that I wanna go after. She's awful, awful. And I'm not even an education person, and this is, I mean, I guess I do do education, but you know, she's really just, it's remarkable, uh, the things that she can do. And then in Massachusetts, where are my Massachusetts Bay State folk? Hooray! 
We got a lot of bad shit going on down there. So in Massachusetts, they protect transgender young people to use the restroom to correspond to their gender. That's great. We went into the legislature. Guess what? It's on a ballot repeal. And it's not trans protections. So you're still not you know, discriminated against in employment. It's only restrooms. It's only youth. Those of us who are the most vulnerable, the ones who have the least ability to speak out, the ones who have the hardest scenario are the ones that the electorate in Massachusetts are going after. And so we should talk at the lunch about how we can make sure that that Massachusetts anti-trans bathroom referenda, and it is a vote that will go. Now, Massachusetts is a blue state. Oh, it's going to be fine. We were here before. Houston, Texas, the HERO Act, the repeal of LGBT protections. We were polling 60% on our side. We're gonna win, we're gonna win. We didn't have to do that much work. Well, guess what, we lost. Cause yo, when people close those curtains to the ballot, yeah, I'm opposed, I don't like discrimination, I don't like Trump. Guess what happens? You do not know, people vote the way they vote. And so we need to make our case to communities. We need to tell our stories. We need teachers and educators there and parents there standing with us side by side to show that these issues are wrapped up uh, with us all. The third area of work is around visibility. You know, in my reality, so often, all the gays are white. All, sorry. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. I got a story here. All the gays are white. All the agents are straight. Where do I belong? Where is my reality? Where is my identity? How can I tell some of these stories that America is incredibly diverse, that the LGBT community is diverse? And so in coalition with allies and supporters, we are telling those stories to diversify the LGBT movement and its leadership. We are so proud to be working with parents uh, who, have, who have LGBT children who are telling their stories of love and acceptance. And I want to show you just one or two of those video videos. Uh, <laughs> she needed a cue about some of the work that we were doing. Our children are shunned, ostracized, and discriminated against in our community. I'm proud of my child. I've always been proud of my child. It's time to take a stand to really support your children, my children, and our children. Share your story of love and acceptance for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender children. After all, family is still family, and love is still love. One more. And imagine if you're. Imagine 我以我儿子为荣依然是爱 I do this because I love my son You know, if you're watching your favorite Bollywood movie on uh, uh, the India channel or your favorite Chinese soap opera and these videos came up we're so proud to have 26 million Americans view these in their languages. Now, these are on YouTube and they're on TV, but coming out doesn't happen in a 30 second PSA, right? And so is there information that we can give to young people, that we can support people who are working with young people to try to educate them and support them? We have translated materials in over, 28 diff in over 25 Asian and Pacific languages. We have the nation's uh, we have the, all the world's Muslim languages. People seem to forget that most of the world's Muslims live in Asia. Bangladesh, Pakistan, Malaysia, Indonesia, India. 
And so we have these materials in Chamorro and Samoan. And so we're so happy to be working with NEA over a new project to try to give teachers, educators, and school personnel information so that they can support their LGBT AAP youth that is culturally competent and is language inclusive. And that the fact that we have rights and that rights can go further, that they, local rights are not a ceiling, are not a floor, are not a ceiling, but they can be a floor. That for Asian Americans, coming out is a process, not an event. I'm here, I'm queer, get used to it. Well, you know, what are the parents back home gonna say? And I'm not talking about people in Baltimore, but the relatives back in India. Or what about your ancestors? Right? Who talks about ancestors in the coming out process? We do. The coming out takes a very long time, and they need support from all of you to be able to make that happen. And it is tough because our parents have struggled greatly for us, have sacrificed so much for us, and we want to honor them, but we also want to achieve all that we can become. And so we're really excited about doing this, and I'm so happy to work with, with Monica around this, and we hope to have a launch on October 11th for National Coming Out Day. We have a conference. Oh, by the way, you're all invited. Uh, we have our national conference in San Francisco uh, at the end of July. It's after yours. And so we're happy to work with NEA around a workshop on microaggressions, implicit bias, and stereotyping. Y'all should come to San Francisco. We'll have a good time. You know, we need to regroup, too. We need to conference amongst each other and try to figure out what, are the, what is the work that we are doing because it, we have lost so much in these past few months. You know, and in my organization, too, we are challenging questions of both, do we go back to basics and be very focused on those bread and butter issues, or do we work on broader social justice and intersectionality? You know, my brothers and sisters and siblings, there is so much work. We are all interconnected. That opportunity is for us all. That we must all rise up and that we must all be able to advance in our lives and career. There is no one or the other we must work together and build those allies and support. And that is the work that we are facing in the community. That is the work that we are facing in the movement. So I'm going to wrap up, but I want to just tell you a little bit about my own experience with NEA. So I came out in the 80s. Remember the 80s? Yeah, yeah, some of y'all too young. Uh, the mid 80s, and we, there was this new disease called GRID, gay related immune deficiency, which later became AIDS and HIV. I was, I was convinced that in 1983, I was going to catch AIDS and die. But I would come out and I would be happy for those few years as a young person, as a teenager, before I came out. And Mr. Kaplan, my English teacher in high school knew something about me. But this is the 80s, he couldn't say anything. And I was not ready to say anything. But so in the school play, he had a character who was a gay character. Now, the gay character didn't do anything gay. I mean, it was just, in the script, he was just gay. But it was a way for me to understand, in his way, that I am not alone that there are other people that are out there. Mrs. Mayerson, my high school guidance counselor, who all my friends would talk, about, talk to about their boyfriends and girlfriends, I was able to talk with her about my own experience. And today, I have a son now. He's a terror. Uh, <laughs> I love him, he's 11. But, oh, maybe not today, a couple of years ago. When he was in second grade, or maybe third grade, he came home and told my partner and I, Two boys can't get married. My son, with two dads, told us that two men cannot get married. And so we talked with him and we talked to the teachers, like where is this coming from? And our school principal and his third grade teacher said, you know, there's another kid in the school that has different values. But there's a way that we can do this work with your son and with others to understand the diversity of all of our families. There are parent, families with two moms and two dads, with only one mom, with two dads, and they're not gay because there's a stepdad. 
two moms and one mo two dads and one mommy. And she was able to tell the story and get them to understand that even though you may have your own, some children may have their own values and their own opinions, that the world is also more complex and that you can make your own decisions, but you should know that there's many kinds of families in our community. Hugh Wall as NEA members and his educators have an incredibly tough job to do. I would not be here today were it not for the school personnel that had made me understand that I'm worth more than a faggot, that I can advance and do more than just be a Nelly. That you, when I had no one else in the world to look to, teachers, educators, guidance counselors, sports coats, were the ones who said, it's okay, we can affirm your experience. Oh my goodness, my mascara is running. <laughs> Not what I was going to say. Um, what was I going to say? I'm off script now. That y'all have a tough job to do. You are attacked. You are the new nemesis. When did fucking teachers become the nemesis in America? <laughs> your lives on the line for us. Yo, we talked about first responders. We talk about cops. You know, we got to talk about teachers being in these schools, protecting our young people, protecting our... And it's not just the words. It's not just the guns. It is not just the guns. It is the words. It is the words of discrimination. It is the words of hate. That is what is hurting us. That is what is killing us. It is not just guns. It is words and thoughts, and that is what you do. You inspire our minds. You inspire thoughts. You inspire us. You inspire us to know that we can achieve our fullest potential, that we can achieve so much more, that we are not alone, that you are the ones who are doing this work. I, I'm so sorry. I am so, I am so grateful to the NEA. I am so grateful for people in schools and in the professions because you are the ones who are saving me and my community. Thank you for the work that you do every day. Oh, I'm a wrap.